My name is Emily Hallis. I'm a reporter with the Washington Examiner. And today we are interviewing one of the astronauts that was stranded for about nine months um, in space that is now returned to Earth. Speaking today to Butch, um, can you just tell us a little bit about your recovery process? You have been back on Earth for a little bit over two weeks now. How are you recovering emotionally, physically, um, mentally? What What is that process looking like for you? Oh, well, thank you, Emily. Let me also introduce Nick Hay. He's the, the commander of the Dragon that was launched in September with a couple of empty, empty seats that came up and was what actually brought us back. So uh, it's great to have Nick along with me as well. So how am I feeling emotionally, mentally, and spiritually and st stability? I think we're handling it pretty well. Um, return to Earth is much like the last time we've all we both flown in space before. And so that uh, familiarity with the, the various aches and pains and neurovestibular and balance and all that that we have experienced in the past really helped this time. I think the time frame has been minimized to our transition back. I know it has been for me. I think with Nick said the same. We talked about it. Um, and so that's ongoing. Uh, mentally. I don't, it was never a mental issue to begin with. Um, initially, way back months and months ago, transitioning from Starliner, coming back on Starliner, affecting the tests that we had planned for, developed, trained for, uh, and, and then wound up not doing. That transition for me, because I was focused on Starliner so much over several years, that was my primary focus, though we were prepared for International Space Station stay. Uh, that was my focus. So that shift from when that when that went away, when we weren't the decision was made, we were not coming back on Starliner was a little bit um, more extensive for me, because when that's all you do for years and years and years, then all of a sudden that stops. Uh, that's not something you can necessarily it's not easy to just flip the switch and go and change. So there was a little bit of a transition there, but that was months and months ago. And we've been space station crew members, uh, uh, crew nine crew members since September when, when Nick got there. So I think we were pretty stable in that for this rest of the period of time. And now, goodness, that was a long time ago. We still focused on on some of the issues and, and doing our part to, to help the processes going forward with those issues. But as far as the space station portion goes, uh, Nick can elaborate more. Uh, it's It's been somewhat seamless because of the experience that we've had in the past. And speaking to that, the kind of the obstacles that you've encountered up there for nine months, obviously, can you tell us a little bit about the lessons learned? Um, what is the path going forward? And what are the takeaways, um, the main takeaways from your nine months up, up there? Well, from the International Space Station aspect, I see success. I mean, these programs have a processes in place this was completely out of the ordinary, completely out of the expected. And the, the system, which is uh, many people passionate about human spaceflight, working together across multiple uh, agencies, not just within the United States, but abroad, our international partners, uh, coming together to affect the plan to continue our presence in space, continue the expeditionary kind of mindset when crews arrive and when crews come back to do all that and make that work changing Nick's plan from coming up with his crew that he'd been training with for years and then coming up with just two to affect those seats to bring us back. That was a monumental effort. And I think there's some great lessons learned out of that. And we will incorporate those going forward. Uh, and certainly with Starliner, there's been many lessons learned that have already, we've already gone through some processes of, of going through those discussions, but there's more to come. We're still going to have those as well. Nick, um, to you, what, what would you say is the biggest lesson learned um, in, in your case, you, as Butch said, you've been training for years um, to, to carry out these missions. What is your biggest takeaway? It, you know, so I guess a lesson that can apply to, to anybody that's, that's watching this or, or reading this um, is that you don't build resilience in the moment. You build the foundation of resilience years in advance. And so, you know, Butch and Sonny and myself, uh, you know, the entire astronaut corps, we're constantly building that foundation of resilience so that we can adapt to the situation uh, that's thrown at us because every space flight in, ends up becoming unique. There's unique challenges. Uh, there's things that are unexpected and you have to respond to those. Uh, and, and, and that's how you get through it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's relying on friends and family uh, it's building the resilience in those support networks. Uh, and, and that's, you know, if you're facing challenges in your life, 
ask for help, reach out and help others. Uh, that's how you get through all of this stuff. And we're just an example of that. And speaking to the future of space exploration, um, there is a vision to have millions potentially of uh, potentially civilians um, exiting Earth and and exploring space, even potentially colonizing Mars. Um, what would you say are the challenges that faces, particularly from civilians who might not have the tools that you guys as experts have, and even experts are running into into challenges. But what what would you say for civilians that might look like, and and how those efforts can be targeted going forwards? I'll I'll be brief in my comments, and I know Nick's got some good comments as well. You know, we are in our infancy of space travel, and we are taking baby steps because that's a necessity. We are for lack of a better term, we are professional astronauts. And that's what we've trained for, for years and years, the roles that we play. And we may not do things that are astronaut -y every single day on space station, but there are days that that training and the specific things that we are doing, only professional astronauts can do. So that is not something you want to just throw somebody into uh, in your comment about the civilians doing these things. Uh, I think we can get there eventually, but we are still in the fledgling stages of that. So transportation to and from space by those that are not trained uh, like we have been over years and years and years is not something that anyone should aspire. You should aspire, I guess, if that's what you desire to do. But you can't just uh, think that you go to space uh, like many do and that you can, you know, you're capable of doing anything because that's just not the case. That's not realistic. So I think the future is bright. I'm not very brief, am I? I think the future is bright, uh, and uh, I will leave it at that. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> well, I'll pick up where you left off. The, the idea of having thousands or tens of thousands or you know countless civilians going and experiencing what it's like to see the Earth from space, uh, that really excites me because the more people that can share in that perspective and look down and reflect on just where we are in the universe and look down at the earth for the small little planet that it is in all of this vastness, look down at continents that really don't have borders, uh, look down and see that we are all on this small little rock together. I think we all end up benefiting from more people sharing that perspective. Thank you, Butch and Nick, for joining us today. You can find more coverage by The Washington Examiner at thewashingtonexaminer.com. My name is Emily Hallis, and I'm a reporter with The Washington Examiner.